Good morning. We are gathered here at a critical moment. The science is clear. The need for urgent action on climate change has never been greater. And I will say there are reasons for optimism. Today, we have over 90% of global emissions covered under an economy-wide net zero target. And since we gathered at COP26, we've seen progress on policy action in the US, Europe, and beyond. But as we have seen from many reports that have come out in the last few days, we are still not on track to meet 1.5. So the stage is set. We are at a historic inflection point on climate and the time has come to shift from ambitions to action. At Google, we believe that our work on sustainability first has to start at home. And that's why we've set a net zero target across our operations and value chain by 2030, which is 20 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. But we also know that we will only succeed in addressing climate change when we enable everyone to take action. And so that's why we're bringing our data and AI tools to the table to support governments, businesses, and NGOs in setting bold climate action targets. And unfortunately, we also know that people around the world are already dealing with the impacts of climate change and that we can utilize technology to give people better information in times of crisis. We're doing this, for example, utilizing AI to provide better flood forecasting for communities around the world. For example, during Pakistan's severe floods, we were able to provide nationwide SOS alerts with information from government authorities. And just last week, we announced that we are now providing flood forecasting information for 18 additional countries across Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia. And of course, there is so much more that we are working on. So I am truly honored to be here with you this incredible group of leaders who are driving progress on climate action. And I am quite heartened, I will say, just from the breadth of conversations happening this week about how we can implement and collaborate. So there has never been more urgency to act than now. We need to seize this moment and move towards progress on a 1.5 degree C future. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Somini Sangupta. I'm the international climate correspondent for the New York Times and the anchor of our Climate Forward newsletter. What is the Climate Forward newsletter? Well, it can come to your email inbox twice a week to help you make sense of this life-changing, world-changing moment. We bring you uh, every Tuesday and every Friday, the biggest ideas uh, in the climate world, the arguments that are happening, the changes that are happening, and we give you a quick rundown of what you need to know. So I hope you'll subscribe to the newsletter. It's nytimes.com slash climate forward. Um, I am delighted to kick off our three-day program here in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. We're going to dive into really the most important issues on the table this week. Uh, this is a very high stakes meeting, as you, as you all know. Uh, lots of things are going on in the world that are bearing on climate action. Um, geopolitics, energy crisis, food security. My colleagues from across the newsroom will be leading discussions and debates here on the stage over the next three days. At this session, we're going to start with just setting the scene for you. What are the opportunities at this conference? What are the risks? What are the fault lines? So a big welcome to those of you who are here in person. A big welcome to those of you who are joining us online from around the world. Just a quick note that you can join the conversation online using the hashtag if you choose to. It's hashtag NYTCF. That's NY New York Times Climate Forward. Here's how we're going to manage what I know will be excellent questions from the audience. You will have seen note cards and pencils on your seats. 
If you have a question, please write it down along with your name. Uh, and make yourself known to one of our roving producers. They will collect the card from you, and um, I will see a, a, a rolling list of questions, um, and we will um, get the mic to you to ask you that question, okay? So we're gonna get straight to it. We're gonna start off the discussion with a conversation about um, what we can expect uh, what we can hope for uh, as this conference really gets underway. We're in day three of COP27. Um, and the, the panelists who are joining us, I have to say, these are, these are doers. Um, these are three women who have made things happen. So I am w delighted to welcome you to the stage to join me, Laurence Tubiana, um, the CEO of the European Climate uh, Foundation. <laughs> Laurence Tubiana, you were the chief climate envoy for France for, uh, for many years, and as such, one of the architects of the Paris Agreement. You're one of the reasons we are, we are here um, today. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland. <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon, you were a uh, host to the COP26 negotiations last year. I visited uh, Glasgow for the first time and was utterly charmed by it. Um, and Hakima El Haiti, the former Minister for the Environment from Morocco. Hakima El Haiti, welcome. Okay, um, I will Take a seat here. Um, how's this? Is this mic working? Yeah? OK. I want to start um, really by getting your impression of just one quick thing. Yesterday, when that family photo was taken of the leaders, there were 110 of them. Seven were women. Seven were women. 103 were men. I, I, I just. Did you notice that? And if so, what'd you make of it? <clears throat> That's fantastic. And uh, you know, I'm a little bit the grandmother of the climate negotiation. I started very early on in 1992. And uh, at that time, there were very, very little women represented. And now, it's all over the place. The leaders, whether the youth movement or the ministers or <clears throat> the doers, they are women most of the time. And uh, and Paris Agreement, I can tell, was really produced by a coalition of women from developing countries and from developed countries. And without the women in Paris, I could not have achieved what we achieved at that time. So women are central, and that's not the end. We have to continue doing it. And you know the story. Huh? <clears throat> Men are putting, just creating a lot of mess, and the women are there to clean it. <laughs> I did notice that the, the people who are actually organizing the photo, getting everyone to stand in place, well, many of them were women. Um, well, I think, I'd need to check this to be 100% sure, but I think 7 out of 110 actually represents backwards progress since Glasgow last year, where it was slightly more than that. I think in that photograph, we see one of the reasons for what is a gap in the, 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 the sense and the, the impatience and the, the passion in civil society and amongst people outside the negotiating room and what is being done mm -hmm. in the negotiating room because Laurence is, is right, there are women everywhere in the climate debate and discussion, but the decision makers are still overwhelmingly men. Mm. So if we get more women from outside the room into the room, then mm. perhaps we can start mm -hmm. to close that gap more quickly mm -hmm. because women are being disproportionately affected by climate change. They often uh, are the ones who need to design the solutions because often it's their lives that are affected not just by climate change, but by the solutions to climate change. So we need, not just on climate, but on every issue under the sun, <laughs> we need more women around the negotiating and decision-making table. Um, it's been seven years since the Paris Agreement. Um, are we where you imagined 
where we would be. Mm. Because where we are, as we've discussed um, uh, back there, um, we are in a moment uh, where the mood is one of frustration, bordering on anger, distrust. So, uh, Hakima, please. Yeah, I would love to, to hear uh, Laurence Tubiana before me because she is always optimist and she is inspiring me. But unfortunately, I have the floor at the, the first. And uh, let me tell you that we, uh, we are not holding this cup in the better situation in the world. We know that uh, we have uh, had the uh, health crisis which shadowed the, the, the climate priority. Now we have this war uh, of Russia on Ukraine with all the devastating uh, impact on, on, of course, on uh, the Ukrainian, but uh, the war is not only killing Ukrainian, uh, the war is weakening uh, Europe, it's hungering, in hungering uh, the Africans, and uh, the consequences on the prices and the inflation are uh, so that the priorities on uh, climate and uh, climate change and climate actions are, I will say, the shadowed. I know that many, many actions were done and that the involvement of the civil society, of business, territories, that there is a so big dynamic now which is giving optimism. But the problem is that in the facts are giving the wrong signal. CO2 emissions is still increasing since the Paris Agreement. Subsidies are still increasing. They have never reached a so high uh, amount of subsidies since 2020. So 2021, the subsidies were doubled. And uh, we were talking about phasing out or phasing down coal. And we are seeing now that many countries are opening old installation coal installation. Others are planning to build coal installations. So I think that the, the, the war, the, the, the context, the geopolitical context is not helping hmm. the climate agenda to move in the right way, mm -hmm. even though I don't want to be pessimistic, but there are many reasons to be worried about keeping alive the 1.5 mm -hmm. degree C objective. Lawrence Tribiana, are we where um, you had thought we would be? <coughs> of course not. <coughs> For two reasons. <coughs> the change which are embedded in the Paris Agreement are very deep. Uh, it's about the temperature target with the 1.5 degree C as where we have to limit the global warming and it is about going to net zero emissions at global level by 2050 or very soon after. And this is, you know, something that when most countries, when they sign up the agreement, they didn't really understood what did it mean. Hmm. And it took this five, at least five or six years, and Glasgow was the moment where everybody fi finally understood what does it mean, really. The companies, uh, subnational, and of course, Scotland in particular, began to say we need a plan, we need to, but that is the objective, and it, it took a lot of time for people to realize. So my first, in a way, assessment is Paris Agreement, and I'm very happy we did that, but we did that very late. 2015 is very late. You, when you understand the past dependency, the problems to adjust and, and in a way combat the forces that doesn't want this to happen, because they are there and very, very powerful, I must say, uh, you know, if we have had that five years ago or ten years ago, we will be in a much better shape than we are. So now we are rushing a transformation that is very difficult to accomplish. So on one side, I think the Paris Agreement works. Now, most, more and more government now have a climate plan. One hundred and more than 90 countries have taken the net zero uh, emission target for 2050 or around that. We will see India moving quite forward. The Chinese are implementing some additional policies. 
But this is late. We, we have, uh, in Glasgow, we decided to cut the emission by 50% by 2030. We are not there. So I think uh, the problem is a rush, and the rush is difficult socially and politically. So that's why my view now is we have to improve the governance of the Paris Agreement. We have to integrate much more in the action, the delivery, the accountability, the subnational, that's why we are launching that thinking with Nicola Sturgeon very soon, how we mobilize even more the state level. And you see that the US plan, for example, cannot meet uh, the Biden commitment, the Joe Biden commitment it, it, it did last January or February or April, I don't remember the date, uh, when he took uh, power. But uh, so the only solution is to have the state coming in with additional uh, action. And that's true for the whole world. And that's the same for the business. So I think we need uh, progress and improvement. And that's why I was, I hope that the leaders would really commit again, mm. prove that they commit to multilateralism in an open and more democratic way. I hope the leaders would really make the vulnerable countries the center of the, of the problem and the attention. And I think uh, the leaders have to demonstrate that they are doing something, not just letting the civil society and others push them to do it. They have to be a little bit more active, I may say so. And they have to say that really they listen to science, and the science every day, every week, every month, just are telling us we are lagging behind. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a problem now of civil society, citizen, non-state actors in general pushing, uh, but at the same time being accountable, in particular in the business and financial sector, and on the other side, government now has to really accelerate the path. First, Mr. Nicholas Sturgeon, can you describe the mood? What are you hearing? Um, I, I think the mood is increasingly impatient and frustrated, and yes, in some quarters, bordering on justifiable anger. And therefore, there is a lot, of, lot at stake here. Um, on climate, I, I choose to be an optimist because I don't think the alternative takes us anywhere, but it's really, really important that we don't allow optimism to be blind faith because we're nowhere near where we should be right now. And I think Lawrence is right about the, the reasons for that. The Paris Agreement came much, much later than it should have done. But we're not on track for 1.5 degrees. And let's remember, for some parts of the world, 1.5 degrees is still catastrophic. Mm -hmm. But the world is on a path much closer to 2.5 degrees. Yeah. And we need to be honest mm -hmm. about that. I think it is absolutely correct to say there needs to be much greater or, uh, transparency and accountability. And I would say this as the the leader of a, a devolved government within a state uh, party, but we need to harness the power of uh, non-state actors much, much more here because many of the levers lie with us. I also think there are real issues right now about trust and faith uh, because we've got to focus, and we were talking earlier on, there is a concern that we're not talking enough at this COP about the, the need to reduce emissions. That should absolutely, must be the priority. But around some of the other issues, climate finance, the $100 billion a year still hasn't been delivered. That erodes trust and faith. And we have a situation even now where the, the global south still feel that they're having to come and plead with mm. the rich countries to acknowledge, let alone address the issue of right. loss and damage, for example. So there is a real need to make tangible progress, to have real accountability, obviously for the achievement of what we all need to achieve, but along the way to retain a sense of trust and faith in the process. And I think that trust and faith is what is on the line here in Egypt over the next couple of weeks. And we're not going to achieve everything that people would want to achieve here, but whether it's on loss and damage or commitments around emissions reduction, there must be a tangible sense of progress and not allow other big important issues to divert attention. Because frankly, sure. what we're dealing with in terms of energy supply, the cost of energy, the answers to all of these things are the same answers that we need to find for the climate crisis. So these things are actually 
underlining the need for progress on climate, they're not reducing it. So I, I, I think the mood is, you know, to say it's sceptical would be an understatement, but mm -hmm. that's perhaps the most optimistic way of describing it. Right. Lawrence, to be honest, you, you said, you know, now this all has to become real. Targets were set, now it has to become real. Nicola Sturgeon, would you tell us just very, very briefly, what are Scotland's targets? And in practical terms, how do you meet those targets? What's hard about them and what's not so hard? So I, I, Scotland is seeking to do, and, and let me say at the outset, you know, we are facing the same challenges in, in meeting targets as right. any other country is, but we're seeking to do what I think every country that is able to should do, which is to go faster than the minimum. So Scotland's target is net zero by 2045. The, the UK as a whole is net zero by 2050. And we have a target of 75% emissions reduction by 2030. Believe me, that really, really focuses mm. the mind. Now, we are in, and the reason we can do that is because we have vast renewable energy potential and, and reality. Our land mass uh, lends itself to you know, much greater tree planting. You know, Scotland represents about roughly 10% of the UK population. Uh, recently, we've been responsible for 80% of the tree planting in the UK. Already about just short of 100%, equivalent of about 100% of our gross electricity consumption already comes from renewable sources. Uh, of course, we import and export, so the, the reality is more complex than that. Uh, and you know, we are massively expanding offshore wind. Mm. We've got great potential in hydrogen. So it's really difficult. We, you know, it's by no means guaranteed that we can meet that 2030 target, but without setting it, we've got no chance of meeting it. What's the hardest part, the, the, the really the toughest part of this? The, the hardest part is the investment and the finance to make the transition. Scotland is and has been for most of my lifetime an oil and gas producing country. So we have a significant number of jobs dependent right now on fossil fuels. So and a tax to, base. We, the tax base is a bit more complicated because of the tax flows within the UK, which I will not divert the discussion into. But yes, it generates uh, tax and economic activity. So we need to transition in a just way the economic activity from mm. oil and gas to renewables. That's tough and it doesn't happen easily. But, you know, this is not easy for anybody. But the cost of not doing it is much, much greater than the cost yes. of doing it. Mm. You've mentioned that the war in Ukraine um, you know, threatens to set us back, and in some ways you're already seeing that. So I want to just take a minute um, to understand what impact um, you think the war and the attendant energy crisis, food crisis, inflation, what, is that hap what impact is that having on people right now, and what impact is that having on transitions, on energy transitions? Uh, it, across the continent, because there is no one Africa energy transition. Every country has slightly different issues. Let me tell you that uh, the history of humanity showed that any time you have a crisis, you have two options. Either you uh, choose the fastest way to get out from the crisis, or to use the crisis to change the game and to change the paradigm. I can understand that the impact of the war on Europe, it's huge economically, socially. I can feel the, 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 the deep, I would say, uh, uh, trouble people are facing in Europe because of the lack of gas. But uh, the, the impact of the war has transcended the borders of Europe mm -hmm. and uh, has impacted Africa, you know, that there, this is a war between the two uh, important or most important providers of uh, uh, fertilizer and grain. And grain, right. And Africa is importing between 30% to 70% Egypt is importing 70% of its grain from Ukraine. So the impact on Africa is huge. The impact on the world is huge because we saw that the price of oil and gas is increasing day after day. So the, 
socially the impact worldwide is important. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's leads that some countries took some decision. They say that it's provisory. And uh, for example, the EU has declared the gas, which is a fossil fuel, uh, mm -hmm. uh, fossil fuel declared the gas as en green energy or energy for transition, green energy mm -hmm. for transition. But uh, European banks are refusing to invest on gas and fossil fuel in Africa because this is not green in Africa and it's green in Europe. So this Should is... Should Africa get to develop its gas resources? Yeah, uh, let, in your me, view? let me just... Uh, this is to say that's what we need. We need to have more coherency. We cannot, as developed countries, send the bad signals. Because if you send a such signal, why not Europe and not Africa, you know? So we need to send the right signal. And the right signal first will be to respect the commitment of the Paris Agreement. The $100 billion, second, the capacity building and transfer of uh, technology, third, to finance adaptation, and the most important one is to keep everybody mm -hmm. in board and to maintain the trust. And now, yeah. we are not speaking about trust anymore. Now, the Africans are angry. Do you think, in your view, should countries in Africa that have gas be able to develop new gas projects, whether for export or for you domestic You know, Africa is emitting less than 4% of CO2 emissions. Africa has 600 million people who have no access to energy. 600 million. Africa needs 10 years or 15 years to develop uh, renewables. So to develop renewables, we need time and we need investment and we need money and we need capacity building. We need capacities to develop such kind of... But Africa has natural resources. We are speaking now about gas. Take the Senegal, for example. They have gas. This, this is something which is there. And they are not responsible. They, they don't, they doesn't have the historical responsibility <coughs> of the pollution. So they want to produce gas. And now with the war, the Europe is paying $600 billion mm -hmm. to Russia to buy gas. But Africans are not allowed to develop, or not allowed, they are allowed, but there is no investment for gas installations mm. now. So I'm not saying that this is the right thing to do, but I'm saying that there is a climate justice yeah. to implement. Okay. This is uh, first yeah, I, I just wanted to come in on that point because it is about climate justice. I, I was at a, a similar event to this yesterday with uh, Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, and she made the point that you know, she would rather not exploit natural gas, but unless the developed world provides the finance for countries like hers to develop and to find the solutions to the issues they're dealing with, okay. she's left with no choice. So this is not just a, a question for African countries or Caribbean countries. This is actually one of the choices the mm. developed rich world has to make. Are we going to give the developing world the choices to make that then are consistent with tackling the climate emergency? Or again, are we going to leave them with only a, an invidious choice to make? We have a responsibility here, not just uh, put uh, African and, and other countries into that really difficult position. I have to ask you, what about gas in the North Sea? Should that be developed further, given we the can, demand? We, we cannot, we absolutely cannot go on with unlimited extraction of fossil fuels. No. And, you know, I make this point in Scotland, and because of the history of Scotland with oil and gas, it is not uh, uncontroversial at times. But, you know, my government doesn't hold the decision-making about licensing in the North Sea, but I don't think we can just go on with, okay. with fossil fuels. We need to mm -hmm. move away. My responsibility is to ramp up the renewable yeah. alternatives as quickly as possible, which is what we're trying to do. I think, <clears throat> uh, first, of course, consistency, and there is an element of, I, I don't know if it's hypocrisy, because it's not just, it's just inconsistent. The way Europe just, and some European countries go to some countries in Africa, 
and, and want to invest, uh, as, as you know, Akima uh, in Senegal, for example, on big infrastructure for uh, the gas transport towards Europe. And at the same time, of course, uh, pleading for a green development for the whole continent. At the same time, we should have a sort of realistic discussion and not, I think climate justice, when it is in a way put forward by oil and gas companies, come on. Mm. That, I cannot believe that. But, and because I think for African countries, as, as Nicola and Akima said, we need on the financial side, on the investment side, where of course developed countries are powerful on what the World Bank decided to do or uh, IMF decided to do. That's why I think the discussion is much beyond the UNFCCC now. But we have to understand that the investment in the gas transmission uh, is an alternative. Uh, you have to make choices. And Europe is not making the good choices either. Huh? We are planning a lot of LNG facility installed that will not solve the short-term crisis, but that will embed us, create a past dependency for more import of gas in the future. And that, in a way, is the same for Africa. The investment in pipelines, you have to choose the investment in pipeline on the investment on the uh, regional and continental grid. And you have to, and this, there is no money to do the two. We need a private investor. Uh, Akima has been a powerful champion to have the private finance investing. But you know, they will not invest in, or you know, the big pipeline from Senegal to North Africa or to the grid that we need across from Morocco, for example, to other countries. Mm. And that is a serious discussion. Mm. And the rest is a little bit ideology from both sides. And I am sorry for that, because we don't have now, between Europe and Africa in particular, a good, reasonable, serious discussion. We are moving symbols because of different interests that are at different layers, companies, government, unilateral decision from some European countries, lack of solidarity for, within many uh, uh, European countries. And in a way, of course, you understand why Senegal or Nigeria are yeah. arguing for gas. But we could listen to other countries like Morocco or Kenya or even South Africa that are wanting to have another way. So that's, I would hope, that now we have been talking about that in generality. We sit down, we look at the just energy transition plan of every country, and we make the right decision that the country has to decide. If hmm. this country wants to decide gas, nobody can prevent that, and that's fine. And I think that's not the capital who is lacking to explore gas and oil, hmm. unfortunately. Um, a reminder to uh, the audience, please write your questions and your names on the card, and please um, raise them so that the mic runners can, can come and get them. We'll take some questions, you know, in a, in a bit. Um, I want to get to the, the central, the biggest sort of um, uh, fault line in these talks is over loss and damage. Can you... Um, can you just explain why that is so important, what the opportunity is this year, and what the risk is this year? Who, who wants to take that? Do you want to take that? Uh, well, Akima, go ahead. Uh, I, I want can. To, just to add something to what uh, uh -huh. Laurence Tubiana said, yeah. which is really very quickly. important. Yeah. I think, uh, Laurence, that we need more coherency in uh, the international uh, policies. When you are deciding, not um, talking about Europe, uh, where Europe is deciding not to invest abroad anymore in fossil fuel, that's great, but don't invest in Europe. This, the problem is no, that we are still investing in fossil fuel installation in Europe and promoting that we did a huge step and we will not invest anymore in Africa. That's the two way, two measures. Mm -hmm. So, and we are taking decisions in Europe which are impacting directly the South and which are opening other doors. I'm not happy about my continent to be the ally of Russia or China. This is not the right model of, the, the, of democracy and development we want for our continent. But they are sliding back from the cooperation with Europe, 
because of such incoherency in the uh, in policies. So Africa should be involved in the discussions and in the conclusions which impact the future of Africa. So that's very true and that's very important and a good discussion we could have all together. That nowadays we cannot, dis we, we want sovereignty on our decision, but we are interdependent. Yeah. And I totally agree, Akima. We cannot pretend that we don't want to invest when we are investing. And we cannot pretend that gas is not a transition energy when we are putting that in the taxonomy. So totally agree. And really, I think that's why we need a, a real serious discussion. But maybe you want something on loss and damage. And let's, let's get to loss and damage. It's a central issue in these negotiations, right? So what are the opportunities uh, and what are the risks? And why is it so important? Well, the cost, no. Uh, uh, I haven't checked the insurer's uh, balance sheet this year, uh, but last year it was more for the insured risk on climate. It was more than 40 billion that they lost in 2021. 2022, I don't know still. 40, 40, 40 billion. billion. Uh, and of course, uh, you know that the part of the capital assets who are insured is very small. Mm. Uh, the rest are not insured. But already 2021, they were saying, okay, stop. If this continues, we will stop insuring. We will stop. Some insurers are saying, climate risk, we will, not, we will stop insuring them in 2025 or 2030. That's really, mm -hmm. how you imagine the global economy without insurance? I, mm. I can. So that's the first thing, the awareness of the cost that the system cannot afford to have. Plus, the fact that for once, and I hope that this COP will deliver on that, the notion that you cannot just put some processes or dialogue in front of the extreme events impact. And, and now, of course, the climate carnage in Pakistan, well, everywhere there was yeah. catastrophe in 2022. So now you cannot say, oh, we should have a dialogue or we should have a process. That's over. So the mix of the cost, the, the economic perception of the cost, the fact that for a, a country like Barbados, you know, you invest in infrastructure, it is destroyed, and you offer your borrow money, it destroyed, and then you have to rebuild and you have not paid the debt. And that's why Maya Motley asked for a, a debt relief or restructuring because of climate events, and now the IMF is recognized. So, so you know, this cannot be solved only at the Convention on Climate Change, but it has to be solved by the financial system external, internally. And it has to be reformed because of that climate risk, as, as Nicola was saying, we didn't, we didn't f understood the cost of inaction. These are the cost of inaction, mm -hmm. just there. So mm -hmm. now we have to pay for that. Is it realistic that we will emerge from these two weeks with an agreement on a funding mechanism for loss and damage, First Minister? I, I would like to say yes. I think realistically, uh, probably not. Um, I, I hope I'm wrong about that. But I do think it's really important that we emerge from these two weeks with something tangible and concrete uh, that people can see the end point to uh, an agreement. You know, this, we, we talk about these you know, complicated terms and concepts. I mean, this is a really fundamental question of, of climate justice. Countries that have not caused climate change, countries that are already deeply indebted, that are suffering disproportionately the impacts of climate change, and, and these are impacts now that are, are you know, embedded in, we can't mitigate them out, uh, and, and are, are expected to deepen their own indebtedness and trying to uh, deal with them on their own. And, and therefore, the, the rich world has a, a responsibility here. There's massive sensitivity about the, the language of reparation and liability, but there is a responsibility. It's a, it's a moral responsibility to help countries deal mm. with this. It's complex. There are a range of finance mechanisms that are needed, insurance being one of them. But there has to be, firstly, an acknowledgement that loss and damage is as important a part of this discussion as mitigation and adaptation. There needs to be a recognition from the developed world that there is a responsibility. Mm. And then there needs to be a real, I think Lawrence is right, mm. dialogue. We've had 30 years of informal dialogue to replace that now just with formal dialogue is not enough. There needs right. to be a mechanism to see funding flows to where it is needed most. And I think the Secretary General said yesterday, this is a litmus test of this COP, and I think that's true. 
Um, can we take a, a question me, from, me, one second, let me just yeah. get a question in and then we'll come back to you. Uh, a question from Brad in the middle. Could we get a mic to Brad, please? Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very aware we're all here in Sham talking about climate. Next month, we're all going to Montreal to talk about biodiversity loss. So my question to you is, with COP15 coming up in a month's time, how important is it that we combine these discussions of climate and biodiversity to create tangible progress? Does anyone want to take that really quickly? Because we've got three minutes left on the clock. It's essential. Um, you know, the, the, these two, it's the same side of the, two sides of the same crisis. And, mm. you know, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, we need to address both and we need to, you know, be really integrated in how we do it. Yeah. Question on the left from Larry. Can we get a mic to Larry? Thank you. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, my question is about the U.S. midterm elections. I um, wonder how many people in the audience and at, at COP realize what's at stake in terms of global climate action. Uh, what do you foresee the impact if the uh, Republicans take over one or both houses of Congress uh, and then uh, roll back Biden's commitments on climate and uh, increase uh, fossil fuel extraction and basically uh, go in, in the wrong direction. So what, what would that affect um, I don't hear anybody. COP negotiations? I see, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. What's at stake for climate in the midterm elections? What happens if Republicans take one or both houses of Congress, what are the implications? Do you want to take that, Laurence? Yeah, uh, IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is effectively a very important plan of, for investment in U.S. Uh, and uh, as you know, it is based on tax credit, tax exemptions. That feel for me that I know that the climate change is a very ideological and polarized discussion in the United States, more than probably than in many countries in the world. But I, I do think that at that stage, the, and it, it will be a bad news, huh, of course, if uh, the Democrats are losing the election, because of course the Republican Party is particularly aggressive against climate action. But on that element, it's so favorable even for Republican states. Uh, like Texas, for example, who is the first provider of uh, renewable energy of, of the United States, the tax credit will not and has not been uh, cut uh, under Trump administration. So this is an increase of the plan. The problem is that on the other element where we hope that U.S. could come up, which is international finance, it is really, well, there is nothing in it. And that if the, of course, if the, Demo the Republican wins the, the Congress, we will have a lot of difficulties or probably no chance to have the United States meet, meet their targets in terms of international finance. And they, they are doing nothing for, for, of course, the last, during the Trump administration. And Joe Biden has promised 11 billion, which was in a way compared to Europe, relatively okay. minor contribution. And this is not happening. So there is two sides of the coin. But I'm not so worried about the internal element, but more on the financial element. We are uh, at time, but I want you all to please say one last thing in really one sentence. When this conference comes to a close, what is the one outcome that you would like to see in one sentence, please? Hakima, what is the one outcome you would like to see? Difficult because... One uh, sentence. Mm. <laughs> I will say uh, peace because peace will allow us to come back to focus on climate change, to focus on action, to mitigate. And the more we mitigate, the less we need to adapt, the less we need the climate disaster. I didn't have the chance to talk mm. about it. Okay. And uh, that will help us to reach the objective. Peace. What is the one outcome you would like to see 
by the end of the two weeks, First Minister. That, that enough is achieved here to maintain faith in the process, particularly faith in the South, and because, not just of uh, the, the substantive importance of it, but also because of what I think it symbolises, I think some tangible progress on loss and damage is, is crucial okay. to achieve. Tangible that. progress on loss and damage. Lawrence Tubiana, what is the one thing, in one sentence, please? I think one, the same, uh, the recognition that we cannot avoid that question, that loss and damage, we have to deal with that, and we have to deal with a mass, uh, many numbers of financial instruments and, and solidarity. And the second is understand that climate ignore borders, ignore geopolitics, ignore the military. That's not, we cannot make peace with climate. We can only mm -hmm. make peace with climate if we are in peace together. And that, I will listen to all the delegation to show that. Thank you all for being with us this morning and thank you all for your great questions.